Hello everyone, this is Kaylee Gonzalez with MLC CAD Systems and welcome to video one on my video series where I'm going to walk you through the CSWP sample exam. So first things first, we need to access the sample exam itself. The easiest way to do this is to open up a web browser and I'm going to type in SOLIDWORKS certification. And what I'm looking for is the certification catalog. So we should see the SOLIDWORKS website with the certification catalog underneath that. This is going to give you a comprehensive list of all of the different certifications that are available to you to take through SOLIDWORKS. The one that we're focusing on today is going to be the second item, which is CSWP Mechanical Design. Now when I go into this specific exam, we're going to see several pieces of information. If I scroll down a little bit, what we're looking for right now is the sample exam, which we'll access in just a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about the actual exam itself. So this actual exam in total is over three hours long. But because of the length, what you can do is take the exam in three separate segments. So instead of having to take all three segments back to back in one giant shot, you can break them up into these specific segments. Now what the CSWP sample exam is really covering is only segment one. Segment one is where you're going to create a part from a drawing, have to make changes to that part, and then input your values. That's really what we're covering in the sample exam. But just so you're not surprised, segment two is covering configurations and changing configurations, rearranging features in the SOLIDWORKS part files. And then segment three is all about assemblies. So just be aware that the sample exam for this particular exam is not all inclusive and there will be two extra segments. Now if I scroll down a little bit further, we're going to see all of the different items that you should be very comfortable with in order to successfully pass this exam. So if there's anything in this list that does not look familiar to you, I recommend that you look it up in the help file or mysolidworks.com or ask your reseller and make sure that you are very comfortable with everything on this list because if you're not um, you might run into some issues regarding the test itself or especially when we go to edit some of these items so with that being said let's go ahead and open up the actual sample exam So with the sample exam open, I'm going to scroll down in that PDF until I see the test questions. And you can see that these items in purple, this is what we're going to be making for the first question. And then questions two and three are going to have us make changes to this particular part. When you're taking this exam, I do recommend that you take a good long look at the information that they're giving you because there's quite a bit of information in here. So just make sure that you are familiar with these particular views. So SOLIDWORKS is giving you um, a couple of top view orientations, but top views that are also sectioned as well, and a couple front and right views. If I scroll down to see question one, we're going to see that we have even more information given to us. So some things to take into account are the unit system you will be in most likely in millimeters for the exam. Decimal places are going to be two. I recommend that you do set SOLIDWORKS to two decimal places because it will round for you when you have to input those answers. It's also going to give you part origin, which in this case doesn't matter, the material, and then some design intent about the holes. Now the items underneath here a, B, C, D, E, F, X, and Y are all going to be values that we're going to input as equations except for F, which is our whole wizard standard. But all of the other items, we are going to be driven by equations. This is something that's actually pretty important with this particular test. If you do not use equations, you run a very high risk of missing changes, and you will also waste a lot of time by having to manually go and edit all of these items. Just keep that in mind when you're going through to model this part. 
So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to jump into SolidWorks and I'm going to start walking you through how to do questions one and then we're going to do questions two and three which change some of these these equation variables. With SolidWorks open I'm going to start a part file. So I'm going to just make sure that I'm in millimeters for this and I do recommend that once you actually create your part file that you save it. The reason why is to make sure that if anything goes wrong during the test that you will have that backup and auto recover already saved and ready to go. Again, just if anything goes wrong, you want to save as much time as you possibly can. So after you save that, I didn't necessarily show that. I'm assuming you guys all know how to save files. But once you save your files, then we're ready to go to start with some of the setup information. Again, with this first section in particular is time constraints. You do want to shave as much time off of this as you can, but you need to have that fine line between shaving so much time off of it and then or doing things incorrectly. You still need to have good modeling practices, but there are some things that you might want to do. Things like setting up hotkeys such as M, which is measure. I have that set up as a hotkey. Another item I set up is shift M, which is going to actually be my mass properties. That's grayed out right now because I don't have any model in here, but that will automatically pull up my mass properties. And then another item that you're going to potentially want is to maybe make a hotkey for your equations. So I made that the letter Q just because it wasn't already used. Now, if you don't know where equations are actually located inside of SolidWorks, there are several places that you can look. For example, you can search for equations inside of your search bar up at the top. Again, mine's grayed out because it's already open. And then, of course, the default location for this is going to be under Tools and then Equations. So you can see I have mine set to Q. Again, this is things that you can do to reduce the amount of navigation that you have to go through during the actual exam. So just make sure you're comfortable with any of those hotkeys that you've set up. So the next thing that we're going to do is input all of the information from sample exam. So once you have entered these main variables, remember that F is going to be for your whole wizard, and then we can add some of the additional equations such as, such as X. So with this, we need to make sure that we're going to link this into the existing global variable, which is what you're seeing here on my screen, and then we can add the type of math that we need into this as well. So again, with Y, I'm going to link this into global variable B, add my math to this also to set up that equation. And this right here is exactly why you want to add equations to this um, to make sure that you're getting these types of values um, exactly correct because if you don't, it's gonna affect the rounding, it's gonna affect your answer. Once we have these items sent to our equations, we're ready to go to start with our basic modeling. So first things I'm going to do looking at my views is I'm going to start on the top plane orientation. Now a hint with these particular models, SolidWorks gives you very specific dimensions. What I recommend that you do is make sure that you are entering the specific values as they are. You don't want to get into a situation where you are modeling it differently that causes you to have to do additional math to figure out these dimensions because it's going to make the changes really hard for you. I'll show you an example when we get there. But for now, I'm going to start linking some of these values into my global variables. You're going to see the capital sigma sign next to these dimensions that indicate they are being driven by a variable. So I'm hitting the equal sign and then going down and choosing my specific global variables. You do have to hit enter. You have to link it into the global variable. Um, if you're going to type the global variable in, just make sure you type with quotes and it will still grab that piece of information. So when I go to extrude this, this is going to be 25 millimeters thick. So one of the next things I'm going to do is there is a portion here at the front that is a total of 35 from the bottom. 
So because it's being referenced from the bottom in the drawing, I'm going to start this on the top plane again. And the reason why is to make sure that my values for this are going to be exactly correct based on the drawing that I've been provided. You don't want to have to draw this on the top and then add a value of 10. And that also creates maybe some additional references to other items that could make editing much more difficult. So I'm going to go based on the bottom and then go up to the top. So again, these are completely independent. I'm not basing this off of like an existing face or anything like that. So the next thing I'm going to do is going to be that curved portion right in the middle. And this has a value of 95, again being referenced from the bottom. So I'm going to do this from the top plane. And I'm going to start with my line tool on both sides here and then go into a three point arc. And the dimensions are going to be 80 for the width on this item and then also the same here. One thing that you want to do is understand that a radius is not called out. However, based on some of the information they've provided, I know that I can add sketch relations from the center of the arc to these other lines. That is going to make the radius an implied or a driven dimension and not something that we have to specifically know. It's going to make sure that this point is going to be lined up with this line and the point will be lined up with this bottom line also. Now regarding actual dimensions, this is going to be linked into global variable C. And because this center is already lined up, we know it's going to be symmetrical and I really only need one dimension. Now I'm going to use my offset entities to get the second side of this. And I'm going to reverse that. And make sure you close your sketch. If your sketch is not closed, this is not going to extrude the way that you think it will. Once I have this sketch, I'm going to extrude, and this is going to be upward 95. We have that basic piece of information. Now, still following good modeling practices, I'm doing all of my, my solids first, and then I'm going to go through and start making some additional cuts. So I'm going to make these two bosses and we can see that this particular item which is going to be on the front, this is going to link into global variable X. And again, it is important to keep track of which view you're looking at to make sure that you get these values correct because centers of mass um, could be off if they, they ask you for that. Now when I extrude this, I can see that this actually is offset by 10 millimeters. So instead of creating additional reference geometry, I'm going to use my offset under from. This is going to allow me to choose an offset on where the sketch is going to start. So we can see how this has a gap between the face I actually sketched on and the beginning of the extrusion itself. And I can reverse that and then link this also into global variable D. So you can see this is why I set all my global variables up from the very beginning because it makes it much easier for me to just model as I go, make sure I'm not going to skip any dimensions or items. You don't have to go back after the fact to add in this information. So the second circular boss is going to be my global variable or equation Y. And I'm going to do the same piece of information that I did before, such as adding my offset value. And again, if you've never had to do this, it's a really slick way to be able to add these types of offsets without creating a lot of additional reference geometry that you would have to manage. So I have all of my main bodies completed. I'm going to do one thing in this next item. I normally don't like to mix fillets inside of my tree. I usually like to keep them all at the bottom. However, based on the dimensions that they've provided me, I know that I'm going to need to use an offset entities and I'm going to need this fillet radius. 
So I'm going to add just this one fillet in right now because it's going to help guarantee that my cut is going to be accurate. But just be careful about adding your fillets too soon. You don't want to create parent-child relationships where a fillet is a parent. So just be mindful and be careful about that. So from here, I'm going to make this cut and I'm going to use offset entities to a value of nine and reverse that information. So here we can see this is exactly why I wanted to make sure that was rounded before I did this cut because that value again is not explicitly called out and I wanna make sure this is gonna be accurate. So for this extrusion, I'm going to choose offset from surface because we know that we have been provided that there is five millimeters of geometry or material at the bottom. And so instead of again, having to calculate what that cut's going to be, make use of your offset from surface going to make this a much, much more streamlined. The last couple of cuts that I have, if I hover over this edge, I can make sure these centers are going to be lined up. And I'm using some mouse gestures right now. That's how I'm going into some of these functions relatively quickly. That's another item that you might want to be very familiar with or to make sure you have your own item set up where you're, you can grab some of these commonly used items very frequently. So things such as circles and lines, I always have my smart dimension tool going downward for myself. It makes just grabbing items pretty quick and pretty seamless. And if you did what I did, just be aware, happens to everyone, I just hit extruded ball space instead of an extruded cut. So just be mindful of what you're doing. The next thing I'm going to do is add my whole wizard hole. So we know that this is going to be a counter bore and it's going to give me anti-metric hex bolt. The size is M8 and the fit is gonna be close. Now the additional items that they've provided us are these custom sizing items. So we can add in our value of through hole diameter of 15 the counterbore diameter is 30, and then the counterbore depth is 10. Make sure you are aware of what your end condition is going to be. It should be through all, and then I can choose to place this item on the face that I've selected. Being inside of the whole wizard, we are in the same type of sketching environment that we are in working with any other type of sketch, so I can add my values and my dimensions to make sure that hole is going to be centered. We need to add some additional fillets. These are all going to be 10 and I'm going to recommend that you use your your flyout window to help grab a lot of these additional edges. Again, anything to really help streamline this process. It allows you to grab multiple fillet edges at a time is going to be very, very helpful. And then we did have a couple of chamfer values, which are set to two millimeters and then 45 degrees. And those are going to apply to the front and then to the back. So my material is going to be under my steel and we're going to go with alloy steel. And the next item that we wanna take a look at is going to be our mass properties because we're looking for the mass and we're actually done with these items. And we can see that my mass is 1,004, I'm sorry, 14,207.35 grams. And if we compare that to the key that we've been provided on the sample exam, we can see that we are pretty spot on. On my particular system, I am 0 0.01 grams off. So SolidWorks does give you a little bit of leeway in order to compensate for these types of rounding discrepancies that we see. Just be aware that if you're 0 0.01 grams off, your answer is most likely highly, highly going to be accepted. 
If you are off by much more than that, you want to go back and check your answers, check your modeling, make sure you did not forget anything. So there, there you could have very minor changes or discrepancies like this, but just be aware that it's probably going to be okay. So the SolidWorks exams allow you to use SOLIDWORKS versions back to 2012 or 2010. And so there is a little bit of plus or minus errors that are built into the answers for rounding such as what we're seeing here. So I'm gonna call that good. And I'm gonna go into the second question, which I know is gonna ask me to make some modifications to my values. So question two, is going to have me update a lot of the global variables and equations that we've already set up. So from here, I'm really gonna go through and change these particular values. So as we make these values, we can actually see, or as we change these values, we can see how these items are going to be automatically updating our model in the background. This is another reason why you want to use global variables. We want this so that we can guarantee that all these items are going to be okay. And by doing that, we're actually at the end of question number two. So if we take a look at the answer, what we're going to see is again, we are pretty much spot on with what the answer key provides. So the answer key is giving 16,490.45 grams and I'm off by 0 0.01 grams. So again, I'm not worried about that. We're gonna call that good. It's so such a slight error that this would still be accepted as a correct response. So then let's add the changes to the third question. So I'm gonna go back into my global variables and equations and I'm going to add in these values. So these values again are coming from that sample exam. And once we've added these values, we can double check what our mass properties is going to look like. And as you can see, this time I am exactly on what the answer key provided. I don't have any rounding errors there. So considering I've made no changes to the model, that's why I'm not concerned about the very, very minor discrepancies and other issues or other mass values that were presented. So that's where I'm going to end this video. We've gone through the first three questions of the sample exam. I'm gonna see you in the second video where I finish up the sample exam I'll go through the changes, some things to look out for when making changes, and then also adding additional information into some of those equations as well. So I'll see you in the next video as we finish up the sample exam.